Mr. Shelby Coffey, thank you for joining us today. Tell us your official title here at the Los Angeles Times. I'm editor and executive vice president of the Los Angeles Times. When did you become uh, editor of the paper? I was appointed uh, executive editor about six and a half years ago and became editor on January 1st of 1989. Can you tell us about your career in journalism? How did you get started? Yes. Uh, before that, I had been with Times Mirror's paper in Dallas, which was the Dallas Times Herald, for less than a year, actually, but it was then sold. And before that, I had been with U.S. News and World Report as its editor for about a year. And before that, I was with the Washington Post for 17 years in Washington, D.C., working in a variety of both reporting and editing positions. You've worked for some of the top newspapers and magazines in the, in the United States. How has the uh, journalism business or the work ethics changed since you first began? I'm thinking of the Watergate hearings in particular. Well, uh, a variety of uh, interesting changes have taken place, uh, one of which is an increased knowledge and specialization and increased professionalism on the part of uh, certainly the quality mainstream press core. It seems to me that uh, quite a number of the, the younger people we have here at the Los Angeles Times are better educated, in, especially in their specialties, and are performing a higher level of journalism than was quite the norm when I started uh, over 25 years ago. And that's, that's been a real plus. I think uh, there is, uh, certainly people have commented on the fact that uh, after Watergate uh, uh, there became somewhat more of an adversarial uh, role uh, in the press corps. I think that uh, may be reflected uh, a bit differently, certainly in the Washington press corps, but there has always been a, a role for uh, the watchdog of society that the American press has uh, often served admirably and sometimes <laughs> not so admirably. Uh, and uh, we certainly seek to learn from our imperfections. So I think that um, the increasing uh, professionalism and uh, the sense of, uh, of our social role and even considerably more uh, uh, self-regard and, uh, and, uh, and critical thinking about our own role uh, characterizes some of the trends in the American press today. What was it like working at the Washington Post during the Watergate era? Was there an excitement in the building, like you were really playing a large role here? Or yes, uh, it was. It was quite an interesting time. Uh, there were several phases. If you went back and, and looked at the reporting, there was some of the initial reporting uh, that was done and. Uh, uh, seemed to to point out uh, some difficulties uh, among the people who were running the Nixon campaign uh, over time uh, and with uh, at least uh, a few spells when there were relatively few stories as I recall them. Uh, only over time did the full story begin to emerge. So there, there was initial uh, uh, interest in the story uh, and then after President Nixon's re-election, there was, there was a lot of hostility, and I can still remember going to uh, dinners around Washington, in which that hostility would come out against uh, the Washington Post in particular and the, the, the press corps in general, that they were, they were trying to do something that uh, uh, was just uh, based on uh, cussedness rather than uh, uh, orneriness rather than uh, reporting. As time went on, it became clearer that, uh, that there was uh, uh, quite a bit more than uh, many first imagined uh, to that story. And then as uh, the hearings uh, continued, there was an, an amazing sequence uh, of days and weeks in which new revelations seemed to follow new revelations. And it was, uh, it was quite, 
amazing and also uh, worrisome just as a citizen uh, as to what had happened here. What is your rule of thumb about uh, when you will run a story? For instance, mm -hmm. uh, a while back there was uh, president, stories of President Clinton's allegations of extramarital activity mm -hmm. that newspapers ran using the excuse that somebody else had run it. Mm -hmm. What is your rule of thumb on that? Well, we had done our own uh, reporting uh, on that, and our first rule of thumb was that we were not going to be stampeded by any other competition uh, on it. Uh, the second uh, uh, important element uh, was that we had to see uh, how it was uh, relevant to the public performance, how the private life uh, uh, affected the public uh, performance uh, there. And that did, uh, questions did uh, emerge about that both in uh, uh, Mr. Clinton's time as governor and then in, uh, in subsequent uh, uh, phone call that was made uh, checking on uh, uh, a trooper uh, as to uh, uh, what was being said about that particular period in his life. And uh, as a result, we tried also uh, very hard to put this in context and give a sense uh, uh, both of the, um, of the milieu of Arkansas politics uh, the nature of uh, the nature of the people involved, as well as uh, the issues that this highlighted. As I, if I remember correctly, your story ran the day after CNN uh, ran with it. Was that a consideration? Uh, we actually ran, if I recall right, uh, two or three days after CNN uh, ran their story, uh, but. This was, uh, we ran ours only when we were satisfied that our reporting uh, was, uh, uh, was strong and what we had in there was, uh, was on target and after we had given uh, the White House uh, a chance uh, to reply uh, in a variety of areas. Congratulations on your recent award. Can you tell us about that? Well, uh, a very nice award. Uh, the National uh, Press Foundation uh, names uh, a number of uh, several journalists, broadcaster of the year, which was uh, Bernard Shaw, and they named an editor of the year this year. I was lucky enough to get that. I think the real credit, of course, goes to uh, the editorial staff of the Los Angeles Times because uh, they uh, worked uh, enormously hard and with great effectiveness through a year that uh, began with the Northridge earthquake, uh, ended with the Orange County uh, bankruptcy, uh, and uh, had the OJ uh, story in the middle, uh, beginning uh, in the middle of the year. And uh, so there has been lots of room for what we call our swarm journalism, which is to have. Um, teams of, of people across a variety of disciplines uh, uh, working uh, on many aspects of a large story. All of those were. What is unique about this newspaper? One of the things that is unique is the way it has grown from the path that Otis Chandler uh, set us on uh, in the early 1960s. And he took the paper uh, from <coughs> uh, uh, its location here in Los Angeles and began to uh, see that as Southern California grew, the Los Angeles Times uh, should uh, grow with it even more. And uh, therefore, we have set up an Orange County edition as well as a downtown Los Angeles edition, a Ventura County edition, a San Fernando Valley edition, so that we have um, following, again, uh, Otis's uh, idea that we would have a broad uh, gauge paper that would give Southern Californians a window on the world in a, in a national and global sense so that we have uh, uh, over two dozen foreign bureaus, a large Washington bureau, and national bureaus, uh, and also give the world a window on Southern California by reporting uh, a wide variety of local news uh, in those uh, additions uh, that I mentioned with uh, an emphasis on customizing the local news and that it is that synergy between the global and the local 
That has been one of the great strengths of the Los Angeles Times as it's grown since the 1960s. And how many readers do you have right now? We have one point, uh, uh, around 1.1 million uh, copies are sold daily and approximately 1.5 million copies on Sunday. Uh, in uh, the research that, uh, that people do, it's, uh, that actually uh, comes out to uh, considerably more readers because uh, they average it out so that you'd probably be talking at uh, somewhere around three million readers daily and somewhere around four and a half million on Sunday. Do you ever hear back from some of the people that you have covered in uh, government or otherwise? Uh, yes, uh, sometimes at very high decibel rates. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, folks are not, uh, not entirely pleased with the coverage. Uh, we try to maintain dialogues and uh, 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 listen, listen to folks, and we aim very hard to be, uh, uh, we aim to do our very best to be fair. You're known as an editor who aggressively hires minorities. Could you explain that policy? Yes. Um, uh, when I became editor, uh, the paper was roughly 10% at, at of the editorial staff uh, was minority. And it seemed to me that certainly if you looked at the communities that we serve, uh, that um, that argued uh, for uh, our, our need to not only uh, hire more uh, minorities who would uh, uh, continue to add to the richness of, uh, of the paper, but also to look at, uh, at ways in which uh, uh, strong minorities could move up as assistant and deputy uh, department heads and department heads. And uh, since uh, in a little over six years, we've moved to just a shade under 20% uh, uh, minority. And we also have a number of uh, department heads and deputies uh, who uh, in, in many cases are the first uh, uh, non-whites uh, to be in those jobs. And they are doing uh, excellent jobs and you know, as intended have added uh, a wide variety of, um, of excellences uh, to the paper. We're having a discussion in the society now about mm -hmm. affirmative action and minorities and so forth. Do, do you, if you face the predicament, obviously hypothetical, mm -hmm. of equally qualified people and one was a minority and one wasn't, how would you deal with that in a theoretical sense? Well, uh, I think I've learned enough to, to know that uh, you shouldn't deal with hypotheticals. <laughs> um, I think that you're always uh, looking at, uh, at people and measuring who's the best person uh, for uh, the job. I think you also, it's one of a number of uh, factors that you uh, that you look at in, in getting uh, the best overall uh, staff you can for a large and very diverse newspaper like the Los Angeles Times uh, that you that you want to look uh, you want to look for, for ways to, uh, to help diversify and you want to look for ways to, to have the very best you look for people who will uh, be able to succeed in the jobs uh, that, that they go into and uh, there again we're, we're very gratified that we've had very high success rate. What is a typical day like for you? Uh, interesting question. Uh, generally I get in uh, um, uh, around 9.30, uh, uh, sometimes have meetings uh, uh, right away, uh, strategy sessions, what have you, go over the papers. Uh, generally, three times a week, we'll have uh, we'll have editorial meetings with uh, either dealing with projects or day-to-day -day coverage, other issues uh, dealing with the staff. These are with the editors. Um, I'll probably have talked to two or three of the editors, perhaps on key stories uh, by that time, and then at 11 o'clock. Uh, the publisher and I generally meet with the editorial board from the editorial pages, and they uh, um, will come in with the positions they want to take, and we'll uh, discuss those and uh, hash them out if there's any hashing out to be done. Uh, then we have our uh, front page meeting at 2.30, uh, going over the stories that look like they'll be on the front page. Uh, and 
Uh, in, in between those and after those, there will be meetings often with editors uh, on either personnel matters or uh, there's a fair amount uh, of dealing with other parts of the paper. For example, um, um, uh, there will be meetings on what should be our advertising and circulation strategy and uh, so uh, on a number of those uh, I will attend to make sure editorials part is, uh, is dealt with. Uh, and for, for whatever else I can contribute to, mm. on the overall part. Generally, I um, uh, finish about um, eight, and uh, by that time I've seen, sometimes I go over and see the first edition uh, as it goes up on the boards, which I enjoy, go over the editorial pages, uh, look at uh, front page stories and some others. People bring me trouble stories if there's a, if there's a potential worry. Um, and uh, then the paper, the first edition will arrive uh, around 10 o'clock, uh, which I generally go over and uh, see if there are any, any misspellings in the headlines that I, I can catch <laughs> or uh, any other major things that, uh, that may glare out that you'd be sorry to see in the morning and hope you but generally, we have an excellent uh, we have an excellent night crew, so they uh, they catch many more of those than I ever would. What were your early years like, and did you always want to be uh, in this business? Um, I uh, have always enjoyed um, writing since uh, early days in school, and as a as a result. Uh, when I had a chance uh, when I was at the University of Virginia to uh, uh, do some writing for the Washington Post, uh, I took that and found it interesting. They brought me up at a time of expansion, and so I started out uh, actually as a sports writer, did two stints in the sports department, did magazine writing as well. And that was uh, a yeasty and interesting time because the sports department was a place where there were less constricted rules uh, at that point, and you could uh, you could write some vigor and some uh, freshness that some of my friends and other departments were were having trouble getting past the editors. Uh, nowadays, I probably would have more sympathy with the editors. Uh, nevertheless, it. Uh, I've, I've always found that, uh, that uh, sense of trying to explain some part of the world uh, to yourself as well as to others uh, very interesting and, um, and indeed uh, very gratifying. There's uh, what we do, which is to go out and take, in our case, about 250 stories a day. Uh, pieces of reality, try to put them into words and explain them in a way that uh, will give people a sense of the aspects of the world that they live in, seems to me uh, a worthwhile calling. So I've been, I've been very happy in it. Is it your goal for your writers to be objective uh, in the stories they write, or is that even possible? Well, I think one of the things that is a, a difficulty is that when you get into, say, a philosophical determination of pure objectivity, uh, people can always raise a question and say, well, just because you began a story at this point and not that point, uh, uh, it seems that that's not pure objectivity. You know, words themselves are approximations. They are not the thing itself. So I think that, uh, that what we have to do is work, is understand that and also understand that we, uh, we as reporters, uh, begin stories uh, with, uh, uh, with some uh, conceptions that are brought by our own cultural background. So we have to be ready to be engaged in a dialogue uh, with the people and the subjects that we're covering, with the communities that we're writing for. And that, to, to my mind, is one of the most interesting parts of journalism. It, it is to, 
to learn the other things uh, that, uh, that may go into the background of a story or where a story may go next. It seems to me that our aim should be for fairness uh, and, uh, and for a, a sense uh, not to move towards subjectivity but to, but to give a balanced view uh, of an issue uh, being addressed and that in that uh, way we can make our contribution without getting caught up in, the, uh, in an endless argument of whether something was uh, in some Immanuel Kantian sense uh, pure objectivity. You have the column right and column left. Could you explain that and how that works? These are on our uh, uh, opinion pages which runs opposite the uh, editorial pages. Uh, we uh, have a number of uh, different uh, columnists who write for us. We subscribe to a number and then we also commission a number of pieces uh, so that people uh, who are dealing uh, with some of the large issues of the day as well as regular uh, opinion columnists uh, may sometimes appear uh, on the opinion pages. One of the things that we thought was important uh, since uh, especially on the opinion pages where people are paid not to be <laughs> objective but to take, a, to take a particular stand. We wanted to be sure uh, that we were getting um, a fair number uh, of folks at, uh, uh, who represented uh, the largest uh, prevalent uh, shades of opinion, uh, column people of the left, people of the right, uh, more liberal, more conservative. Um, now, there is, of course, an argument that can be made that those, those terms are not exactly uh, what, they, what they used to be, and sometimes you'll see uh, um, a, uh, a very uh, well-credentialed conservative taking what might seem to be a, a contrarian stand on an issue, and, we, uh, uh, and likewise a person on the left uh, uh, moving, uh, moving otherwise. But we felt that that this would uh, give us, uh, uh, would enforce uh, uh, a chance to see uh, the broad range of opinion and also uh, would be helpful in, uh, in making sure that we were, we were getting those kinds of contributions. What do you do when a conservative like William Buckley writes a column uh, advocating mm -hmm. uh, drug use or legalization? And a liberal like Nat Hantoff writes in a, a column opposing abortion. Do you switch him? <laughs> what do you do in that? No, situation? I think we I think we uh, we let the credentials uh, uh, carry carry them forward. And we also have lots of columnists uh, who uh, who run on yeah. either uh, between those two columns or on days when we don't have a column left and column right, which we do not have every day. We're not we're not trying to enforce uh, a particular. Uh, ideological strictures, but just trying to make sure we keep the dialogue broad. What will computers do to newspapers? Will we even have newspapers uh, in the future? I have uh, uh, obviously a great interest, as do uh, lots of other people in the, in the media business broadly, uh, in where uh, computers uh, evolve uh, to and uh, and where newspapers themselves are evolving. At this point, uh, there, there are considerable uh, interesting elements to computers. We started at the LA Times, our own online version called Times Link, uh, which is on Prodigy, in which you can call up uh, <coughs> many stories uh, from that day. You can call up stories uh, from the past so that you can, uh, you can go considerably deeper on, uh, on subjects. Uh, and you, and there's other material which we have that applies to your local community, uh, which allows us to run things like school lunch menus for your community that day, uh, which we wouldn't have the, uh, the newsprint uh, space uh, uh, to run in the regular paper. So there is no doubt that there is a very uh, rich world there in cyberspace. Uh, the, the, uh, and we've uh, gotten over 16,000 subscribers in just a, a very few months, and we're, we're pleased with that progress. Uh, on the other hand, I think uh, there will be 
it'll be a considerable amount of time, a number of years, until um, until the computers, as they evolve, uh, become uh, quite the um, uh, the major media uh, uh, medium of choice uh, compared to uh, newspapers, in my view. And I think the page is strong and is hardier than it's uh, uh, sometimes uh, thought to be in this time of media mergers and uh, technological changes that we're all interested in and all keeping track of. But um, a couple of things uh, convince me along those lines. One is that uh, newspapers themselves are very cheap. Uh, in terms of the amount of information that you get. They're also divisible, they're portable. If you leave it on the bus, uh, you're not going to be uh, uh, worried in the same way you would be if you left your, your Newton, <laughs> several hundred dollars versus 50 cents, uh, say. They allow random access, uh, as the computer people say, you can go straight to the sports page if you want to. You can. Uh, start with uh, the entertainment section or the front page. Uh, they are very adjustable uh, and they have a great deal of information. George Gilder wrote a very interesting article on this in Forbes ASAP uh, talking about how newspapers uh, uh, gather a great deal of information that is quite useful to people and as they, he sees them as being uh, um, making a very uh, profitable alliance with computer people. There's one other element that uh, I, I keep in mind as we go forward. There's a very fine historian named uh, Michael Kemmelman who uh, was doing work out here on the various uh, shifts in the information epochs. Uh, uh, the shift from uh, on, in radio movies to television to um, uh, and these and the uh, attendant uh, spin-offs and confusion and he was looking at it really from the from the standpoint of two major groups uh, I may be oversimplifying his uh, research so I hope you'll forgive me but uh, one group was a set of culture critics uh, most of whom as a new medium would come along uh, were nostalgic and regretful remembering if, if they grew up with radio they didn't many of them didn't like television much in a much preferable form and uh, tended to be skeptical about the, the new medium. The other people who were often confused as a group though clearly not all and not not forever were the people who were in the businesses um, but in uh, almost all of the cases that he's examining, the old medium was considerably transformed by the new medium. Uh, in, in most of the cases that he examined, uh, the old medium would be substantially transformed by the new medium, but would survive. For example, radio is now very different from the days in which uh, you had many uh, or a number of important large national radio programs uh, that everybody gathered around the way later in the 50s and 60s people gathered around TV to watch uh, their sitcoms. But radio is still a very uh, prominent and profitable uh, medium. Uh, likewise, the movies were transformed, television uh, transformed by cable. And, uh, and so we see, I think, that uh, while newspapers uh, may be transformed, I would be, um, I think that they will, uh, they will be hardy creatures uh, that will, uh, in fact, uh, the page will live long. It is a very good uh, medium. Uh, sometimes we're accused, in fact, the last time I was asked that question on television, uh, I was on Nightline and I was asked, you know, what's it like to be part of a dinosaur industry. I said, uh, um, I have uh, since thought about that and uh, I think it's worth remembering that dinosaurs were around for thousands of years <laughs> and uh, 
as we see from Jurassic Park, they're still quite popular. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you.